Okay, so we did our presentation on O2 a Grecian urn by Keats. As you can see. Okay, so I'll do the first read through. Ode on a Grecian urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, Sylvian historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. But leaf fringe legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both, in Tempe or the bales of Arcady. What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursue? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit, deities of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Thou winning near the goal, yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, uh, happy, happy thoughts, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy, melodious, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love. Forever warm, and still to be enjoyed, forever panting, and forever young. All breathing human passion far above, that leaves a heart high so sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, a mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies, and all her silken flanks with garlands dress? What little town by river or seashore, or mountain built with peaceful citadel, is emptied of this folk, this pious morn, and little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell. Why thou art desolate, can't e'er return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe. Then ours a friend to man to whom thou sayst, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. You're muted. Ah, uh, yes. Next slide, I guess. Um, uh, so I made a bunch of little thingies in um, photography class to more interestingly show Keats's um, backstory, tragic backstory. Um, he was born in lower class London in poverty. Um, he went to medical school, but he only lived to 25 years old. And so that is actually a picture of him on the side. Um, he looked, he looked very, yeah. Um, his, he was an orphan after 15, which as I so eloquently put, everyone I love is dead. Um, his father died of a skull fracture and his mother died of tuberculosis, um, which is kind of the basis for a lot of his sadder poetry and existential poetry. And he also died of tuberculosis when he was 25 years old which is really sad because he had a, a next slide. Yeah. So he had a huge fear of being forgotten by the world. And um, so he, a lot of his writing reflects that idea that he did not want to be forgotten, which he wasn't, um, despite the fact that he only lived 25 years and he only wrote poetry for four of those years. So the poetry type is romantic poetry and that was a movement to reclaim emotion and artistic expression in the 18th century, he's one of the most famous poets from that era. Um, it would often glorify nature. So we've seen this also in um, a lot of American paintings, um, but it, it's also mainly about acceptance of emotions, which was important to him because he was aware he was dying of consumption for most of his life. Um, and so while he was writing all of his poetry, it's actively tinged by that idea that he knew he was going to die quickly. It has an emphasis on aesthetic beauty. So if you read through, when we read through the poem again, we'll see that 
he uses a lot of adverbs, adjectives, adjectives, that's the word. Um, and odes were a very popular type of romantic poetry. Keats is the one that writes the most of them. So this is Ode to a Grecian Urn. And he's the main, he's like the titular, titular um, writer on that. Yeah. Um, so the, liter the literary devices, um, one example was assonance, which is repetition of vowel sounds in the same line. And so more happy love, more happy, happy love in line 25. Um, and it's repetition of the vowel sound of O. And then uh, symbolism, using symbols to represent an idea. Um, the urn obviously is the biggest example in the poem and it represents art and the relationship um, between art and love and life. And then, you know, there's some nature symbols as well. Um, and then a paradox, which is a self-contradictory phrase, a statement that seem, uh, or a statement that seems self-contradictory, but still has meaning. And so her melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter, which is, you know, a paradox, because if you can't hear a melody, how are you supposed to know if it's sweet? And then, um, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's a chiasmus. Um, but it's a clause that's repeated in reverse. And so you find that in the, in the last line, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, which is a really well-known quote from this poem. Okay, so I'm going to do the second reading of this now that we have more information on it. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thou express? A flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities, of mortals, or of both? In Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggles to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever canst these trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid in the spring adieu, and happy melodies unwearied. Forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed. Forever painting and forever young. All breathing human passion far above. That leaves a high, a heart high, sorrowful and cloyed. A burning forehead and a parching tongue. What are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O oh mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowering at the skies and all her silken flans with garlands dressed? What little town by river or by or seashore or mountain built in peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And in a little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O oh, attic shape, fair attitude with bread. O oh, of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought. As doth eternity, cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe, then are as a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. And that is the, yeah. Next slide. Ah, so these are the questions that were in the back of the uh, book and we were just gonna kind of answer these together. So who is the poem speaker? I guess it would just be Keats. Yeah, it doesn't really feel like he's talking from anybody else's perspective. He's just kind of lamenting the um, Grecian urn. And what he's observing is that like the people on the urn will never change, but he will and die. Mm -hmm. asks a lot of questions. What questions do you think? About, I guess. Also, he's addressing the people on the urn, I feel like. Like, yeah. they aren't going to talk back, but he's definitely addressing them. Yeah, especially in, like, stanza two. He's talking, like, directly to that couple. Yeah. Yeah, and he asks a lot, like, 
what are these coming to the sacrifice? Like, where are you going? Why, why are they not changing? Why did they have the right to be so unchanging, I guess? Yeah. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Keats. <laughs> he has a lot of pictures, of, a lot of paintings of him, um, but yes. So this is about the ode, and an ode is an ancient form that originally followed strict rules of rhyme meter, rhythm meter and rhyme. By the time of the Romantics, the ode was more flexible, used to meditate on or address a single object or condition. So what, what's good about an ode, basically, that make it succeed? I mean, in this specific instance, he's like really focusing on the urn. And I think that, I guess that's what makes this an ode is he's talking about like the beauty of the urn, I guess, and just like the beauty of art overall. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like something that I thought was really interesting is that there's clear like each line can be about this long, but he didn't exactly rhyme them, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and also, I think it's very interesting that he's using an ode to talk about a Grecian urn, because that was a more Greek kind of poetry, I think. The last two lines, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know, are among the most enigmatic in all of poetry, both for their content and for the many possibilities of who is addressing whom. Consider four possibilities, speaker to reader, urn to reader, speaker to urn, and speaker to figures on the urn. How does each perspective change the meaning of those two lines in the poem as a whole? Um, I feel like we looked at it generally from speaker to urn. Um, when we analyzed it first. Yeah, I agree. Because, you know, he's just, he's contemplating like the beauty of art and like the beauty of art, I guess, in that like it's frozen in one time. And so I guess it, to me, it's like the speaker telling the urn that the urn is beautiful. Yeah, I think one of the most interesting things is taken as the urn talking to either the reader or the speaker because it feels a lot less like a lament at that point and more of like a teasing kind of, I guess. Yeah. Like, oh, we're going to be beautiful forever. You'll die. Right. You know? And I mean, you talked about how Keats didn't want to be forgotten and he had a lot of death around him. So I'm sure that death scared him. And so I think that, yeah. always, you know, that's shown a lot in this poem. Yeah. And I think it's also a lot about like how not only death scared him, but he's looking at this thing that was remembered throughout the centuries, and he's like, how can I be like this? How can I be remembered through the centuries, unaging, unmoving? Yeah. Notice, noticing that the first and fourth stanzas of the poem are, are filled with question marks, and the last stanza has none, what paradoxical comments does Ode on a Grecian Urn make about art? It's interesting. So what I'm thinking is, oh, sorry. Um, so what I'm thinking is that it's kind of talking about how, like, I guess art can be answered, but you're really looking for the answers the entire time? What do you think? Yeah, because, you know, he never really answers the questions. And so, yeah, that makes sense a lot because, yeah. Mm. I don't know. It's just like, it's so up to your interpretation. And then, I don't yeah. know the words, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's very much like, he's being like, yeah, this, these are all questions I have. And me writing this is not going to change it or answer anything. While the urn described in the poem is imaginary, Ode on a Grecian Urn was supposedly inspired by Keats' visit to the Elgin Marbles on an exhibit at the British Museum. What does this context add to your understanding of the poem? So for me, um, it's very interesting. I, um, I didn't completely look up this urn, but I did look it up to make sure it wasn't one of the other urns I've studied. I've studied a couple urns, just because you go on Wikipedia loops, and it's not one that I have previous knowledge on. Um, but like, I think it's really interesting that this was something on his mind even when he was just looking at that urn. Like he went, he looked at historical artifacts and the entire time, I'm sure he was thinking, I am going to die, I am going to die. Yeah, I think just knowing that perspective 
changes like how I perceive the poem in general and you know just seeing the piece of art is kind of crazy because it still exists and it's kind of like adding to his point in poetry of how like he's dead but his art and the art he was talking about lives on and just kind of yeah yeah I really do like the fact that he was remembered because for all of his agonizing over whether or not he would be remembered I really like that he was yeah I agree yeah. Okay, so the deeper meaning, this poem reflects on the nature of art and how beauty and love can be expressed differently in art versus reality. Um, Keats is observing the images on art and he compares them to real life. So like art can last forever, but people can't. Um, and art is frozen in one single image, but life brings change and new experiences. Um, and love and art never fades, but it also never advances. So, and in life, you know, love can fade. Um, and so that's shown in this part. It says, bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, thou winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. So it's basically saying, yeah, you can't really kiss or do anything like that, but you'll love each other forever. And, you know, um, this girl that you love will always be beautiful. And, you know, that's just what art can do. I'm muted. Um, so my original reaction to the poem was basically being like, this is sappy, this is boring, I've heard this too many times, but then I actually read over um, what, like, his, what his life was like before writing this, and it was just so sad, and it explained so much about his art that it made me, like, that's why I put in a reading of the poem twice, once afterwards, and once before, because it's just so interesting, because once you get his backstory, it, like, explains almost everything about the way he was writing and how kind of emo he was. Um, and so my original dislike is a lot more the dislike of modern love and like the way that he idol ro idolizes it, romanticizes it, because I don't like love poetry very much. And it feels like he was saying throughout the poem, like, look at this urn, they get to love forever. Wouldn't you want to love forever? And my gut response is no. Um, and so that wasn't something I really liked about it originally. But after I read it, um, I realized that like, he didn't have much love in his own life. Like his mother died, his father died, he died. He spent his whole life going to medical school and never even getting the degree for it, which honestly makes me very sad because I know how much medical school costs. Um, and so no, this isn't necessarily the poetry that I'd read on a regular basis, but understanding this about Keats just makes it like so much more of a sad poem because we see what he's going through at the same time and it makes it so much easier to empathize with him as a person. Okay, hey, sorry. Um, so my initial reaction to the poem was I didn't really like it because I didn't understand it at all because reading it the first time through is very hard to comprehend anything that he's saying. But after I read it a couple times and I understand it, I understood it more. I actually really enjoyed reading the perspective that he took because I think it's interesting to just look at art and be like they're frozen in a spot. And that's really cool because it's it looks good and it looks nice and it's something that never fades and it'll always be remembered and like we just was saying um you know seeing like his own life is um really interesting to see like why he would get that perspective and i just think it's an interesting perspective to take because i've never really thought about that um and just the two ideas that reality and art are opposites but it's hard to really think about which one you would rather pick. It just, it sent me into like deep thought and thinking about, you know, stuff like, you know, nothing really matters. It sent me on one of those like spirals and I, you know, I enjoy those thoughts sometimes.
So I'm, I just want to add something because like I was thinking about it while you were talking. Um, and not to add too much of my personal reading in here, but um, I just finished the picture of Dorian Gray and that's really interesting because it's also a lot of like, oh, are art and reality differences and what would be the consequence of becoming art yourself? And I thought that was really interesting because that's also kind of what this poem is talking about, although in a less, you know, murdery way. So the question that I had first was, in the beginning of Sienza 2, oh, um, Maddie, I thought that like we could answer each other's questions. Okay. Um, in the beginning of Stanza 2, there is the line, heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on, not, the sensual, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared. What is the best estimation of what this line means to you? So A, singing is good and it makes me feel emotions. Therefore, I implore the pipes to continue to play. B, I like music. Um, I play more than other music. C, music is good. The unheard song, the urn is singing is better. And D, if a person cannot hear the music, what is the point of playing it? Um, my best guess would be C, because you know, Yay. it's about the beauty of art. Yeah. Yay. Uh, what is the message that you find in this poem? A, love is important and one of the best things that you can have in this world. B, we are all immortal in this world, so long as there's somebody to remember us. C, change should not happen in the world, and it is a person mad with love that believes things should be fleeting. And D, the people on the urn never have to worry about the changes happening in the world, while we mortal still must deal with this. Mm. That one's trickier. Um... I would guess B, just because of Keith's own perspective and knowing that, but I'm not completely sure. I put um, D as it, but like, if you're looking at it from more of a, I guess, worldwide perspective, your answer makes more sense. Um, yeah, I can see where both of them would be right, for sure. Yeah. You know, and it's easy to interpret the poem in different ways. You know, that's classic college board. You don't know which one's right. This is true. It adds the reality. Um, in line 29, there's a line that leaves the heart high, sorrowful, and cloyed. With context clues, what do you believe that cloyed means in this context? A, nailed in as if into a cross. B, sweet to an excessive degree. Uh, C, choking, awful, smoke-filled. D, disgusting, sickening. Mm, my best guess would be between C and D. Um, I go C. Um, it's actually B, because oh, well, yeah, yeah. I found that word and I was like, ah, I love that word because I looked it up and then I took all of the Latin meanings from the word and put them underneath. Um, so you know, now it's my turn to answer questions. Which of the following best describes the meaning of the final sentence, which is kind of long. It's like the beauty um, is truth. Truth, beauty is what I was going for. I can read it, though, if you want me to. Um, I can read it. Okay. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe. Then ours a friend of ma to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all. You know on earth and all you need to know. So A, truth will always exist, therefore truth is real beauty. B, beauty and art represents truth in life. C, as long as people exist, art will be beautiful. And D, beauty in life lasts in eternity. Oh gosh, that one's hard. Um, I'd say C. I actually put A, but C was like, supposed to be like the tricky one, you know? Um, okay. But I just, you know, Truth, because he's talking about, I just took it as like, he's talking about beauty of the girl and how it'll never fade and, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. That's what yeah. I based it off of. Um, the tone of the passage shifts from one of blank to one of blank between stanza three and stanza four. Um, um, I'm like going back, looking through it. Um. I feel like it starts off kind of happy, um, and then it goes to, like, 
questioning. So I'd say D, jovial and reflective. Yeah. I tried to put big words in there. I thought Ms. Elamine would like that. Yeah, they're very fancy. I like candid. Um, the, liter the literary device and description in lines one to two is used to describe the Sylvian historian, B, relate to the idea of marriage, C, express the longevity and permanence of the art displayed on the urn, or D, show the quickness of the world through the urn's perspective. Uh, so the first two lines are, thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time. So I'd say either C or D, but I'm going to go with C because he's talking specifically about the urn. Yeah, C. Nice. Yeah. You have good questions for this one. Thank you. It took me a while to think of them. Thinking multiple choice questions is really, really hard. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is that, that the presentation or is yeah, there something? Yeah, that's else? it. 